Hey, what's up, my friends? Chad Kalick here with a quick update. Now that we've reached 200 episodes of the In a Crowded Room podcast, over the next few weeks, in addition to releasing new episodes every week, I'm also going to be reposting my top 10 favorite episodes thus far, starting right now. So coming in at number 10 is episode number 62, in which I recount one of the most intense paranormal investigations I've ever been on, which took place at a weekend-long paranormal retreat at the Thomas House in Red Boiling Springs, Tennessee. Although we had hosted events before at the Thomas House, this was the first time that I, along with 20 event attendees, were granted access to investigate an abandoned church that sat across the street and adjacent to the Thomas House. As you'll hear, what we all experienced was absolutely mind-blowing. And as you'll see, a truly disturbing piece of evidence was also captured, which demonstrated to all of us that we were definitely not alone. With that being said, enjoy episode number 62 of the In a Crowded Room podcast. Hey, what's up everybody? Chad Kalick here and welcome back to the In a Crowded Room podcast for episode number 62. I am extremely sick, everybody. I knew this would have happened on my way back from our AGH Presents the Thomas House event, which is exactly what episode number 62 is going to be about. But on my way back, we had a nightmare plane trip home, which included almost four hours on the tarmac in a 92-degree plane, which we were sweating like crazy, and everybody's breathing the same air, and this is cold and flu season right now. And my chest is so congested, so congested, it makes breathing a... A little hard right now so if my patter is a bit slow you'll understand why but I wanted to get this podcast out there because the experience that I had at the Thomas House event was one of the more intense paranormal investigations that I've been on in some time with that in mind I wanted to go back to the Thomas House Because it's the only place that I've ever been to that I hosted an event and actually had to shut the event down and get all the attendees out so I could figure out what was going on. Now, I did a previous episode about this, but uh, yeah, it was a situation where just all of a sudden it was like a paranormal explosion. Uh, We had probably over 100 people there and they experienced the salt shakers flying and also uh, a punch bowl spinning on its own, a table and a lamp popping up in the air, multiple EVPs, people captured, a whole group of people experienced back pain at the same time simultaneously. So I knew going into this event that the potential was there for things to get real. Um, But again, I, I had just been away from it for so long you know, maybe I maybe I should have taken it more seriously. But time has a way of doing that. It has a way of scrubbing away those fresh memories. And it gives you a, a butter knife instead of a Ginsu in return, you know? Uh, nothing is as sharp as it was. Uh, the memory is much more dull. I think that definitely happened because I wasn't prepared for what was about to come. So let's start at the beginning. On the 29th, my good friend Craig Powell flew into Los Angeles from Sydney, in which I picked Craig up. We had a series of exciting meetings, and the following morning, uh, we had a great flight in. Flew to Nashville. 
I got picked up by my good friend Justin Ross. I met his attendee Shane, uh, who they also call Bear, because this man is very hairy. <laughs> True fucking story. Um, so I get to the hotel and it's awesome. There's a ton of familiar faces. Brenda, Lori, uh, Bob, and Sharon Ruiz, Susan, uh, so many, so many that make our event so special, very much a family atmosphere. And uh, it felt like we hadn't skipped a beat. I mean, it really didn't. It felt like there was not a two-year, you know, uh, lull in between events. Uh, and all the new faces were amazing people. Uh, my new friend D from Australia, you're a sweetheart. Michael Wilcox, what, what a great guy. Uh, Linda, it was so cool to have you join us and share your stories. Um, it was just awesome. I mean, that's what I love about our events the most is just the people, you know, the people. And, uh, you know, the hotel was amazing, as always. Uh, you know, whenever I plan events, because... You can't guarantee the paranormal, you know, you can't. And if someone says they can, they're lying to you. But what you can guarantee, you know, you want to take care of your guests. You want to make sure that should nothing paranormal happen, at the very least, they're going to be blown away, uh, you know, by where they're staying. And that they're going to have a great time with everybody uh, there. And that... Uh, you know, we're going to do everything in our power to capture paranormal activity. And um, as long as all those things happen, then I know that everyone's going to have a great time. Uh, allow, me to, allow me to grab a drink really quick, guys. I'm sorry. So, like I said, it was awesome. It was awesome to see everybody. And the first night of investigating comes in which I take everybody through the walkthrough of the Paranormal State episode. We shot the episode Room 37. Uh, this was Mary Beth Wiley's debut as well, which was a proud moment for me. Um, and it was super cool. I took everybody around, showed them where all the activity was, and from there we went right into our first night's investigation in which nothing happened. And this happens, I swear, guys, 99% of the time, the first night nothing happens. It almost just feels like it's an acquaintance period. We're like, you know, they're checking you out and you're checking them out without even knowing that that's what you're doing. It seems like just a, a familiarity, like they're just watching. Um, but this happens all the time with the first night. It's just, you know, you can hear a pin drop. You know, there's just nothing. So I wake up the following morning and have this absolutely mind-blowing southern breakfast. And I hear that there is a church across the street that is owned by the proprietors of the Thomas House. And they are saying that we can go over there and investigate. <coughs> <coughs> I'm like, uh, so when I hear this, I'm like, what church are you guys talking about? I'm like, you didn't see it? I'm like, no. And they said, it's down at the end of the driveway, across the street. I'm like, huh, there's a church. And they're going to let us go ghost hunting. And as I wrote in my blog about this, I was thinking in my head, this is odd. We're in the deep south. And they're going to let us go ghost hunt at church. If you know anything about the Bible belting deep south, that's some progressive shit to just say, go ahead and go, you know, <laughs> ghost hunt at church. Uh, so I was impressed. I was like, wow, okay. Well, yeah, let's get people over there because I can't even believe they're allowing this. That's great. So I chose to stay back at the hotel for a couple reasons. Uh, one, I want to keep the numbers down. 
You know, you don't want to have everybody in a, at an event crowd into one location because it's just going to destroy the investigation. Any evidence you may think you have is going to be so contaminated with everybody else's talking, breathing, walking. Um, so I said, let them go do their thing. And I'll stay back here uh, with everybody who's here. And I'm going to make sure that they all have a good time. Uh, and I also wanted to check out room 14 again, which was a room that I was in during our previous event, and which I saw with my own eyes. You know, from my lips to God's ears, I saw a table with a lamp on it, a little, you know, side table, pop up in the air and just smash against the ground. So I wanted to go back to that room to see if this could happen again. So long story short, nothing happens for me. Um, I'm hearing stories throughout uh, the main house, uh, at the Thomas House, the main hotel, uh, little things are starting to happen. People are uh, saying that they've seen some shadow people. They've experienced some knocks that they you know, feel as though these knocks occurred in a way that would suggest intelligence. And, uh, you know, it feels like things are warming up. So I go downstairs to have a cigarette, and, man... I just, you know, hear everybody uh, walking up the hill, a group of probably about seven or eight people, and they get to the front porch of the Thomas house, and I start hearing crazy stories. Uh, glass threw itself and shattered. Uh, you know, rocks were being thrown inside the church. Change, like nickels, quarters, pennies just appeared uh, and fell from the sky inside the church, which, by the way, this is a common theme that happens throughout the world. Change, for some reason, uh, just manifests and falls from the sky to the ground. Google that. Really, really strange phenomenon that's been occurring since the beginning of time. Um, very bizarre stuff. So it's not that I don't believe people. I just lack the ability to believe anything fully unless I'm there to experience it. And, and, I, and I mean, I lack the ability. If I could choose to believe, I would choose to believe because I know these people and I know them to be good people. Um, I just don't have the ability to believe fully unless I experience it. But out of the entire group, the most hardened investigator is Craig. And I look over at Craig, and he looks at me, and he just goes, Brother, in that Australian accent that uh, more often than not just sounds like music. I nodded my head and said, Yeah. And he nodded his head and said, Yeah. And I thought to myself, Huh. So there's a haunted church across the street and crazy shit's going on. I want in. So I tell Craig uh, and everybody else that tomorrow night I will go to the allegedly haunted church. Fast forward 21 hours and I am walking down the dirt road to go to the allegedly haunted church with a pretty good sized group, probably... 13, 14 of us, maybe 15. Um, everybody has every gadget they could bring. Uh, you know, there's you know, cameras. There's the SLS, which I had never used before. That's the Xbox video game console that tries to map out a body. Um, you know, the usual stuff, K2s, things like that. So we get there, and right away we're testing out this SLS, and because I've never used one, I'm trying to find the flaw in it, which is pretty glaring. It's trying to map a human body. I mean, that's what it's trying to do. That's what it was designed for. And it's using heat to do that. Uh, so if you're in frame of the SLS, it's going to map your body. And what a lot of people don't realize until you use a really high-end thermal camera is that your body can heat up 
a small room. When you put one person in a small room, and it'll change the whole, you know, temperature of the entire room, much less things that are next to you, glass, metal, things like that. So the presence of a human being will heat up everything. And now the SLS will start looking for things that are hot. And it will try to paint a human figure over the top of it. Uh, none of these things are helpful in a ghost hunt. Uh, you know, the best way to use that piece of equipment would be to pull everybody out of frame, no human beings, and then just see what the disturbance could be. Um, but anyways, that's what we were doing. We were checking out this SLS, and once I kind of figured out how it works and what it's doing, uh, you know, I was honestly getting a little bored because nothing had happened, so I decided I was going to start provoking, uh, which I did. And almost immediately, there's a glass that's thrown behind me. Pretty loud. I mean, you hear a good solid bang. And what's crazy about that is I was sitting in a circle uh, in which the sound came from directly behind me and I could see where everybody was at in the circle. I could see where everybody's at. So uh, now it is dark in there, but there's definitely enough moonlight and ambient light to make out everyone's body. You know, I knew for a fact there's no way anybody in the group did it. I mean, they wouldn't do that to begin with because if they were caught, they'd be on the first flight out of Nashville. Um, but because I didn't see it with my own eyes, you know, like I said, it's just hard for me to say that was paranormal. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe a glass was halfway, you know, tinkering out the end of something. And our own vibrations from our bodies walking around provided enough bend on the floorboards to cause this thing to fall. I don't know. That's what start. You know, that's what the mind does. My mind starts looking for answers. You know, it does not jump to that's a ghost. So I start provoking heavier and heavier and heavier, and little things are happening again. Little tinkering sounds that type of stuff. And then finally Craig says, let's get everybody on one side of the room and Chad on the other. And I love it. I love it. I know what he's doing. He knows I'm going to provoke. So he's separating it out to try to determine is there activity that is happening directly towards Chad when he is ghost hunting because that would indicate an intelligent response. So he made the right call. I mean, that's definitely how we should have split up at that time. So I could see where everybody's at, and I started amping the provoking up even more and more and more and more. And all of a sudden, boom, I hear everybody scream. I'm like, what in the fuck was that? When I walked in the building, I saw there was a shoe at the clear back of the room. And something with a lot of force just chucked that shoe hard as hell. And it smashed into something right next to the entire group. Now, I knew where that shoe was. I saw it when I walked in. But I did not see it fly in the dark. I just heard where it hit, how loud it hit. So I started, you know, telling everybody to calm down, get the woods together collect themselves, which everybody did an awesome job, an awesome job. I mean, really, the group, you could see everybody was terrified, but they were holding it together. So I started saying, you're not allowed to do that to the group. Do it to me and provoking again, you know, calling it names, daring it to do things. And I kept saying, throw something at me, throw something at me. And all of a sudden, I just feel this doom, 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 doom on my shoe. And I hear it bounce several times. Boom, 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 boom. So I'm like, what the hell? And I turn on my phone. I look down. It's a battery. It's like a double A battery that was thrown directly, like directly from in front of me. Like if you drew a straight line at the end of my nose, that's where it came from. Now, who is directly in front of me? Uh, Justin Ross filming. So, you know, obviously he didn't do it. 
And at this point, I know that nobody in my group is doing this type of fakery. I, I know that. But I don't know what it is that we are dealing with yet. Uh, and I don't have absolute confirmation for sure that this, you know, could be some sort of entity. So I stand up after the battery was thrown and I walk over and I show it to the group and I'm like, look, you know, here's this battery and like it was just, you know, on the ground. I just picked it up in front of me. And right as I'm talking about that, directly behind me, I hear Chad. I turn around and I go, what? Because the only person behind me is Bob and Sharon Ruiz. Now, Bob is like a brother to me. I mean, one of my favorite human beings on planet Earth. Sharon, I nicknamed Mama a long time ago because she, she really is like a mama to me, and that's how I view her. She's a lovely human being that, you know, cares about me and uh, vice versa. I know there's no way they did that. They know that's a big-time no-no with me. That would hurt my feelings. If they did that, uh, it would really, really be a shitty thing. And there's no way two people that genuinely care about me are going to do that. But I want to make sure that nobody in the room did it. So I say right away, listen, if anybody in here said my name, right now is where you fucking tell me, you know. And, uh, you know, it's dead quiet. I said, nobody in here said my name. You know, Bob's going, Chad, no. The thing is, I knew that. I knew that because the only male behind me was Bob. And right away, Liz Bowling speaks up and says, look, I heard it. I heard it. You know, Michael Wilcox says, Chad, I heard that right away, loud and clear, man. And Craig says, wow, Chad, because Craig was in the opposite direction of me. And he goes, there's no question that was your name. And there wasn't. I knew there wasn't. I knew there wasn't. I know what I heard. It was as plain as this and as loud as this, Chad. So at that point, I know for a fact that's the confirmation I needed. So right as we're all discussing that we all heard it, we know where it came from, I just happen to look up and at the very, very back of the room, I see this extremely tall black figure. Again, I'm thinking... It's one of us. But then it turns with, it's, it was almost like an awkward limp. It had this awkward way of walking. And it walked right into this adjacent corridor next to us. It led to two larger rooms. And I go, who is back there? And everyone's like, yeah, none of, none of us. I'm like, oh my God, I just saw it, guys. I just saw it. And they're like, what are you talking about? I go, I saw this big black thing turn and walk into that room. And I take my eyes away from that corner to address everybody in the group. And I'm talking about it, talking about it. And right when I look back, I could see that it stepped back through into the room. And right as I look at it, it takes a step back into the darkness of this corridor. Which I say, I see it again. I see it again. And Lori says, oh my God, I saw it too. So I run over to that corner and I'm stopped dead in my tracks because what's through that door... It's a terrifying thing that most ghost hunters have experienced. It's when the nighttime and the dark grayness of night becomes jet black. It's almost just like just a black hole, man. Like nothing could penetrate it. And I look in there and it's just jet black. And I say to Craig, you know, you ready? Because this is going to get real. And Craig... Craig looks at me and says, yeah, brother, let's do this. Now, at that time, Bob Ruiz has grabbed Lori's camera, and he's right behind me. Justin Ross has a camera, and he has fallen in line, too, so they got our backs as we're going to go through this corridor, which we do. We both go through the corridor, and right away, I could feel that presence. I could feel it so freaking strong. And uh, so could Craig. I mean, and this isn't psychic ability. It's just intuition. And uh, immediately, 
I turned the camera into this long room that's adjacent to the room we were just in. And at the back of the room, there's this window and this light, this exterior light that you could see through the window. I'm just standing still, looking down this long corridor, and you could see this black thing steps in front of it once and walks by it, comes back again and walks by it, and the third time steps in front of the light, completely blacks it out and, and just stays there. Like it was just standing there to let me know, yep, it's me. I was, yeah, really freaked out. Because I just couldn't believe how intense all this was so quickly. The, the glasses being thrown, the battery being thrown, the shoe being thrown, and my name being said. It was just really intense. It just, just so much of it happened at once. So right as I'm staring at that back window, Behind Craig, I hear two, like, power steps, man. Like, something stomped, like, thunk, thunk. And I go, Jesus, man. And, like, Craig just went into, like, this rugby mode. I mean, he didn't know where it was coming from, but he was ready for war, man. And I'm like, Craig, right here. He goes, that wasn't you. I'm like, no. And he moves into the entrance to the next room. And I move into the entrance to the room in front of me. And it dawns on me, oh my God, there's two of them. And it's trying to get us away from each other. In which I say to Craig, Craig, man, there's two of them. Craig says, yeah, it's trying to separate us. And right as he says that, I felt something I haven't felt since the IM6 case. I felt something touch my arm. At first it felt like a tingle, just like a tingle sensation but then I just felt the the pressure of a grip just like if something gripped your arm and I freaked out man I, I, I lost it for a second and I freaked everybody out in the room and I'm, I'm sorry for that I wasn't prepared man immediately after that I feel something do the same thing to my leg and I'm freaking out guys I'm freaking out because it's not supposed to be able to do that. It's not supposed to be able to touch me. And what I mean by that is with the protection that I carry and the way I go about ghost hunting and what I allow and what I don't, and this stuff all comes down to what you allow, it shouldn't be able to touch me even if it wanted to. So I'm concerned. I'm concerned, again, is this something familiar that I know, that knows me? Is this like something from my past that is waiting for me? A million things are going through my mind. A million things are going through my mind. But I got to tell you guys, when something that isn't there grabs you, It's just not something you forget. It's not. It's not. Yeah. Just sitting here thinking about it right now, it's just such an uncomfortable feeling when you when you feel like you don't have control. Uh, so I stepped into the room even further by myself and I started asking and whispering to myself, you know, kind of this prayer I say, and then I address what is ever in the room, and I say, do I know you? Do I know you? Have we met? Do I know you? And you know what? There was little shit going on all over that room, and the next thing I know, I feel Craig's hand on my shoulder. He says, Chad, back out, dude. He goes, back out. He goes, you're all the way in there. There's no way out. I mean, like, there's physically no way where for you to go. And I don't think you realize that right now. And he's right. I didn't. I was so mentally into trying to, to solve what was going on and so disturbed by the fact that it could touch me. I, I was just not making good decisions. 
And thank God Greg was there to just say, hey, man, get, you know, let's pull back, you know. You know, let's pull back. So as I'm leaving, I come out of there. That little voice inside me is definitely telling me it's time to go. So somebody turned on the lights, and I could hear everybody kind of talking and uh, conversing and, uh, you know, about everything that just happened. And I say to everybody, hey, just because we're done, please keep your guard up. Because the lights on or on, you know, off or on don't mean shit. You know, I'm a big fan of the lights being off because it sets a vibe and a tone. And I think your own fear drives the paranormal. It's energy. But the lights being on or off, that has nothing to do with activity. If something is going to show itself, it's going to do it regardless. If something's going to move itself, it's going to do that. Like the lights don't mean anything. So I said, just keep your guard up. And while I was outside, Justin Ross took photos from inside the building. From where I was at, took photos of me and took a wide shot outside of the building. Well, we eventually wrapped up and we slowly made our way back to the Thomas house. And we were all discussing all kinds of theories as to what it could be that's there. I definitely know how I feel, what I think was there. Uh, I do think it was an elemental spirit, which I'll do a whole podcast on elementals. So if you don't know what that is, please Google it. And we get back to the hotel, and we're all kind of sitting out front. And uh, Justin says, hey, check your phone. I just sent you a photo. And the photo he sent was this. Which, if you're not looking closely, you can miss what's standing in the doorway. Which is this. And this, my friends, is exactly what I saw at the back of the room. Needless to say, this was a seriously intense investigation. And everyone was freaked out, man. Nobody wanted to go to bed. So I intentionally started joking around to lighten the mood. And, uh, you know, just telling just things like, just playing with people, just telling, like Justin Ross, I don't know how you're going to sleep in your room tonight, man. I got a gut feeling it's there, you know, <laughs> and when I, I can't laugh right now because my chest is so congested. Uh, but just playing with people, and and uh, by the time 4 a.m. rolled around, everybody was kind of sitting together upstairs in a group, joking and laughing and uh, telling even more stories and and uh, it was just an amazing time. Uh, but that investigation just hit me really hard because it had been a while since I had experienced something that intense. And I got the bug again, man. I got the bug. I mean, I loved it. I loved every second of it. Uh, it did freak me out that it was able to touch me, which I, I know why it was. And I'll share it with you guys. And This is just my firm belief. You don't got to believe uh, me or agree with me. But when you go into really intense ghost hunts, you have to be selfish in the sense that you have to protect you. And anybody else that chose to be a part of it, that's their choice. And they have to protect them. If you start worrying too much about other people, that, that is a weakness. That is a weakness that it will exploit. You have to take care of you. We all have free will. If we chose to be somewhere, that was our choice. And we have to take care of that. At that time, I was completely worried about everybody else in that building but myself. I was totally worried as to what was going to happen. And I just, I wasn't focused. And that's why I was able to touch me. And, um, yeah. So, it was incredible. The event ended um, on a high note, man. Nothing but hugs and love and autographs and we'll see you at the next one uh, so if you get a chance to go to the thomas house please do it is incredible it is incredible the food was incredible uh the vibe is incredible um it was amazing and laura just walked in the door i'm at the very end of my podcast so i guess that's the right time say hi say hi laura hi 
Hello. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay, babe. All right, guys. Much love. Uh, I need to try to drink something and get rid of this sickness right now in this chest and get rid of this congestion. To everybody who came to the Thomas House event, you know I got nothing but love for you. Thank you for listening to episode number 62 of the Inner Credit Room Podcast. I'll be back tomorrow with more. All the best.